Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me this week is Nathaniel Pennington, CEO of Humboldt Seed Company. Thank you very much for joining me today, Nathaniel. Thanks for having me. This is great. All right. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. I would also appreciate it if you could leave the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Also, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. Nathaniel, I always like to learn a little bit more about your path to the cannabis industry. So what brought you here? Well, you know, I was an avid cannabis enjoyer, consumer, whatever you want to call it. Um, I try to, you know, not tell people how young I was when I started, but, you know, it's teenagers, right? And um, anyway, uh, you know, I, I was, grew up in on the East Coast and in in New York and Philadelphia area, and uh, it was just everywhere. And and it struck me immediately that like of all for all of the warnings and hype, it was just so, um, you know, not such a big deal. And it was so it was enjoyable and and just didn't seem like the monster. It was kind of you know, made out to be. And, uh, I always found that that was like silly and frustrating because there are so many other hardcore drugs that are very dangerous and deadly and so on and so forth. And, um, it just feels crazy. It's always felt ridiculous that cannabis is in that, uh, gets described that way. And then it makes you just question the whole, um, that was what it did for me. I I was like, Oh, if this is like this, then I wonder, you know, what other things are. And, and it, I was able to avoid the worst of things. And, um, but I, I certainly know, you know, people in, in my same high school that, that really went down a bad path. And, uh, I think everybody does know someone in, in their life that's, um, ran, ran aground with, uh, substances. And so, Cannabis just to me never had that. It wasn't really likely to do that. <laughs> so I still feel that way this day. It's like safer than alcohol, if you ask me. Um, no, kind of like 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 drinking coffee in the morning. <laughs> and no, and there's all medical, you know. But then I I came to Humboldt and we had just when I got here we had passed the Proposition two fifteen. Um, it was my first time ever voting. I was 18 years old and, uh, you know, that was the beginning of medical cannabis. That was the first place in the world where, you know, cannabis was legal with the doctor's recommendation. And so then it was shortly thereafter that I was growing it with, uh, friends and mentors. And then, um, the breeding aspect of it that of course is, not just an interest or a hobby it has become um our whole existence here is was just kind of stemmed from wanting to be self-reliant or have not having to you know kind of wonder where the next year's um seed or or genetic would come from mm-hmm. and, and taken care of on our own so what role did you have with Humboldt when you first came to the company? Oh, I started, I'm the founder and CEO. So I, Oh, okay. See, that's what I thought. But then you're like, but then you're like, when I came to Humboldt, I'm like, Oh, all right. No. Well, I wasn't born and raised here. So I I moved to Humboldt in 20, in 1995 and I was 18 years old and Mm. really, you know, we kind of started selling seeds as the company in 2001 and uh, pretty much right away went down and actually got a seed company business license and it was not allowing us to do anything cannabis related, but we've always done, um, our own seed saving and for lots of different, you know, we, I mean, right behind me is maybe we'll have a chance we can go look at it, but, uh, it's my kitchen garden and, or, or the, the cruise kitchen garden, I should say. <laughs> and, um, you know, today Aside, along with maintaining the thousands of cannabis plants and 
the uh, operations that we have out on the coast that are more like, you know, indra- indoor in our distribution center in Eureka. Um, we like to grow vegetables and, <laughs> and we've always done it. And so we're just like, well, we have to have, uh, you know, tomatoes fresh in the summer. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it really like that taught me so much about cannabis. I, I run into a lot of really successful people in cannabis that, um, you know, had experience doing, uh, whatever other big commercial type crops. Um, even if they were a, you know, small organic farm, there's so many things that translate over, but then again, there's so many things that don't. And so, you know, I would probably rather have, you know, the background of mostly growing cannabis commercially rather than, you know, jumping completely from growing lettuce or strawberries or something over to cannabis. Cause there's so many specific things that people want from their cannabis. Um, whereas a strawberry there's better, there's good strawberries and then there's not so great strawberries, but they, at the end of the day, they're like kind of just strawberries. <laughs> yeah. Why seeds? Yeah. So that's a question I get a lot. I mean, we grow, you know, we've grown with clones. We've done a bunch of clone genetic releases. Um, when we started the company, you know, it was the clones were around and we were doing cloning and, but we just really felt like, I mean, one thing that we know, and, and I can't, I, no one's ever really argued with me about this, but seeds grow better than clones. And they just, they have a taproot. They, uh, a plant that's, that's grown from seed, you know, often doesn't have, well, I mean, it, it definitely is much less likely to have any pests or even viruses, pathogens, like, you know, the hop latent diploid virus that's going around is, is incredibly unlikely to be passed um, you know, via seed. So mm-hmm. even if you have a, an infected plant that you're using and you're breeding, it's, it actually can remove, you know, the hop latent, maybe there's differing opinions. We have one study that says maybe 5% would, could have hop latent still, but another study that we have says that it's like 99 point something percent not doesn't carry on. And, uh, no, nonetheless, it's still like you've not 95% gotten rid of the virus in the progeny. So like those things, it's just, you're essentially starting fresh, um, not carrying pat pests, not carrying pathogens into your next cycle or into your next season or whatever you do. So Um, And they're just healthier plants. And we've always really loved working with seeds. And, you know, now that auto flowers are becoming more and more, you know, that's just a simply a trait and people don't, I don't think people understand that a trait can be often like, and I'm not even talking about with like CRISPR or GMO, but just through, real traditional breeding practices but but very good and serious breeding practices not you know just throwing pollen on one thing from another but through that that you can take the trait that is you know automatic flowering so that just means the flowering isn't triggered by the changing in sunlight or the changing you know like turning your your grow lights to 12 hours on 12 hours off it literally, no matter what you do, it's going to produce buds and have finished product within three months. So, you know, we have auto flowers that are a little faster, some that take a little longer, but generally, you know, three months or less is sort of the, the auto flower timeframe. And that gives people so much, like a lot of, uh, you know, it, it, 
there's a lot of advantages of that and they're not just for outdoor large scale operations. I mean, they're kind of obvious for the outdoor large scale operation, but even, you know, we've got a fellow in, um, he's a commercial guy and he's doing some studies with us and, and he's got full blown hydroponic set up completely indoor, uh, few hundred lights and rolling benches and a nice setup and he's strictly on our auto flowers and literally just planting um one bench every three weeks and so therefore harvesting one bench every three weeks and and the beauty of it is that you would normally have to have the room separate because you've got a flowering room and a veg room and and you're constantly moving the plants from the veg to the flower or or shifting the light constantly within the rooms to trigger flower and when you do that you're changing the environment that the plant lives in so you know when something has with auto flowers you can have 20 hours of constant light and so that's 20 hours of constant photosynthesis. You don't have to cut it down to 12 hours during the flowering cycle. And so like your HVAC and all of those things don't change. Whereas, you know, if you've ever flowered cannabis in an indoor, you know that it's very different what you have to, your air conditioning or your heating or your um, just generally your HVAC is going to be a completely different, um, uh, you know, setup for, mm -hmm. for flowering versus for veg. A lot of the time during flower, you're, you know, having to get rid of moisture and potentially even having to heat the place. Whereas during flower, you know, you've got, it's too hot <laughs> or, I mean, mm -hmm. excuse me, strike that reverse it. But but I think folks know what I mean. Basically, there's a bunch of change that happens in the room during that flower to veg or veg to flower transition. And so autos um, negate that entirely and you just plant them and they're ready to harvest three months later. So we see a big future in that. But circling back, you can't do those with clones like they're impossible because a clone auto flower will just flower out. Uh, if you try to keep it any longer than, you know, the three months. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of work to be done still in the whole genome and you can't do the work without um, having, you know, without DNA combinate combining and split <laughs> like, you know, if we just stay in, in stasis with simple clone lines, then I think we're missing potentially a lot of what cannabis has to offer too. And so that's another thing is by breeding, you're creating new, you're even, you know, possibly even creating new cannabinoid con combinations, certainly new turpin combinations, and therefore creating new you know new and unique ways to enjoy cannabis or ways to heal with it or you know whatever your goal is starting in uh 2001 i believe you said uh through now what is the company how is the company transition from you know you founding it startup mode to now the largest licensed seed company in California? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we didn't, we didn't go the route of taking a bunch of investment money or anything like that. Thank God. Cause you know, I, I feel like I saw a bunch of that happen all around me. Um, and, and it might've been just luck because I don't think that there are a lot of people out there that really think of, cannabis breeding and making cannabis seeds and making cannabis genetics as like uh, 
likely to be lucrative or whatever. Um, I, maybe it's not the quickest way to, to make a bunch of money. That's for sure. But it's definitely something that we enjoy and it's, it's our niche. So we didn't get as hounded by investors or purchasers. And so we really bootstrapped for a long time. And, um, you know, luckily the space back then was, was really kind of the pioneers and it wasn't, uh, a ton of venture capitalist type, you know, people that were just trying to super scale. Cause back then, if you scaled too much, too fast, you, the law would come in. And oh, gotcha. take. So it was sort of, um, the, the boundaries were not as clearly defined as they are now, which can be frustrating because, you know, fortune favors the bold a lot more in that kind of a situation. But then it was a little bit of just like, well, you just sort of had to know how to be just bold enough. And uh, I would always say like, in the days of medical, you know, you could, you could have prescriptions for friends and um, family and things like that. And uh, some people would get, would push it really hard. They'd get so many prescriptions and it would just be this gigantic operation. And um, of course you kind of knew that, you know, those were, it was all really just feeding somebody's wallet and the tendency would be that for those folks to eventually have a visit from the helicopters and all that and and so that was 2001 through 2015 or 16 and then it kind of started you know the recreational proposition passed which you know to the lament of many um you know, like Dennis Perone, for example, who who wrote the the initial um, voter initiative to legalize medically, and uh, you know, Dennis kind of warned against some of the things that are happening right now. Uh, you know, we lost Dennis about three years ago, uh, but. I'm sorry. Um, He's a great, great man. And, uh, you know, we really, one of the people that's, it's one of our heroes. Um, And he definitely warned that, you know, this recreational cannabis, the way that people were looking at it as sort of a big potential, big money grab um, to be a little bit cautious. And there were a bunch of, things that were supposed to protect um, the smaller operators so that they could, you know, get their ducks in a row, get marketing, get all the things that you need to have a successful small business. And then, you know, the state actually still opened it up to over an acre. I mean, that was like the, the safeguard was that no one's going to be able to grow over an acre. And and then lo and behold, people were able to grow over an acre. They just had to pay more money to the state. And so that was really frustrating for people. But for us as a seed company, I mean, we fought against that. We, we weren't lobby. I mean, we openly signed petit. We fought against opening it up because we knew it would be bad for small businesses. Um, but it didn't certainly didn't affect our bottom line. I mean, it, you know, no matter what the bigger companies were coming and purchasing pro our seed. And, mm. uh, so, you know, that kind of between 2017, 2018, 2019 in that, that, uh, time period, we saw what was happening and just decided like, well, 
Um, you know, we could sit back here and lob, you know, throw stones at the industry and be like, well, it's not what we envisioned it. Or we could take part in one of the most exciting new industries in the world. And we decided to do the latter. Uh, but you know, I'm no fan of how it's really played out. And I certainly find it hard to believe that, um, in this country, even I'll say that we really want to help small businesses because there are so many things that are stacked against them that I think we could do differently, but that's another topic. And, um, and yeah, so we scaled and we just kept scaling in within California and then took on partnerships with other companies in places like Oklahoma, um, Oregon. And, and these were all partnerships with people that like we, we knew personally and had existing relationships with. So um, it wasn't, you know, us coming in and, and, buying up licenses in other states it was partnerships that were developed um that seemed natural because you know even though we're our really our whole product that we cr have created is genetics it's an interesting thing because you know we've always understood it that we should have production of genetics in the state that we're uh selling in so we've always kind of played by the rules in that regard. And in, in Oklahoma, we have genetics production in Oregon. We have genetics production, but more recently it's become kind of clear that the interpretation of the hemp law is that, you know, cannabis seeds and cannabis clones, things that don't contain any THC at all, um, even though they can turn into cannabis later on that they're not really any more considered to be a controlled substance, oh, okay. but, but we still have to, you know, like we're still beholden to our license in California, which says that what we produce here stays here and so on and so forth. So that model of partnering with licensed companies in other States has held it's importance for us and that's mm. what we continue to do. And, um, you know, we we're also in Canada. Um, uh, mm -hmm. we had turns that came here to our anchor farm. We call it in Northeast Humboldt where I'm at right now. They interned with us for, um, one full season of seed production and harvest and all that good stuff. And then we're just so, one thing to go work on their own, do it, create a project. So we partnered with uh, Nymera, which is a license up in Canada and produced, it was neat. We made the first, world's first organic feminized cannabis, cannabis seeds or certified organic. <laughs> and now we export those um, from Canada. But all this stuff sounds, you know, it is cutting edge, but it's certainly not easy and it's not glamorous. It's just been a grind for the last eight years have just been a lot of, of serious effort and, and also just, you know, making bold choices like, you know, turning the entire farm into a breeding facility and mm. you know not wanting to do you know not growing flour at all um just decisions like that um you never know how it's gonna turn out for you but well it seems like over the last you know 20 years or so you've certainly just made the right choices whenever you came to a crossroads um or at least stumbled forward anyways <laughs> um could you describe to me what is seed production like so, you know, you take, you find, um, like we have this long, uh, process that, that involves years sometimes of, of creating IBLs, which are 
essentially purebred types of cannabis. And then when you have, it's, it's a lot like sometimes I'll compare it to dog breeding. You know, like if you have a really purebred poodle line and a really purebred uh, Labrador, then you can make these really great consistent crosses of, you know, Labradoodles. And I think, was it like Obama <laughs> had a, famously had a labradoodle that everybody loved but um you know and, and that's really actually what is a real hybrid and so a lot of what people refer to in cannabis as as like a f1 hybrid or something like that is not in normal ag or plant breeding what you would ever call a, a true hybrid because it's what we're what's most everywhere in the cannabis space is just poly hybrids and essentially they're mutts they're like the mutts of the of the dog breeding world and you know the great thing is is that um you can clone cannabis and so if you find that mutt that you love and it's the best dog you ever had then you can theoretically you can keep it around forever and just keep you know enjoying that same mutt and, and that's what 99.999% of, of the genetics that are grown out, you know, commercially are just literally uh, a great mutt. And, but anytime you actually start breeding something like from a real, you know, we're going to, uh, especially if you want to make seed and have people have the same experience over and over again from your seeds, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a science experiment. Isn't really a science experiment until you can repeat it and it has the same outcome. Right. And so the only way to do that in, in, in breeding is to create these highly inbred lines and these purebred pure lines that don't have genetic drift you know, and don't have very much genetic drift. And, and the more you work with them, the less they're going to have that. And that takes literally years. And so one of the neatest things about um, creating those types of seeds, those true hybrid seeds, like it's what 99% of big ag crops are, are made from, you know, hybrid corn or hybrid, uh, soybeans or hybrid tomatoes and, and everything is a hybrid and and the one of the beauties of it is that you know if someone goes and tries to actually you know take that work that you've done and just take the the hybrid seed and and breed it somewhere else and call it something else it's, it's really going to come out different because it only reproduces that way when you take trait a and trait b and bring them together um and it's sort of this magical phenomena which is just called um you know a true breeding hybrid you also get this this other phenomena which is called heterosis and it just means that two distinct genetic backgrounds meeting again I mean, there were all related, mm -hmm. uh, you know, since time immemorial, let's just say. But when you have two divergent groups that meet again, you often get these an amazing progeny that come out of that. And so real hybrid breeding makes that as well. Do you only work in purebreds, not mutts? No, no. I mean, that's the thing is that like with cannabis, it's, it's a little bit of both because we haven't even figured out what it is that we like yet mm -hmm. as humans, you know? So like we're still, and, and working with, with mutts, it's the best way to figure that out because you're going to get so much diversity out of what you plant from seed when you're breeding with, with something that is like that, you know, and, and there's still so many, genetics and, and purposes to be discovered and just like back to my analogy with dog breeding you know um like we we don't know yet that 
cannabis is going to be great for, you know, duck hunting. <laughs> so there may be, and, and eventually we'll find some strain that goes, gets the duck and brings it right back. And, and so the analogy of that, we just don't know all the different possibilities from this plant. And so I think that there's, for us, we, we see that there's a point in doing what we're doing with, with our purebred lines and being able to make true breeding hybrid seeds. But we also are balancing that with the reality that we don't know exactly what we want from cannabis yet. And, and so it's a little, you know, it's not like you can treat it like a soybean. So I don't really see the, you know, the common, um, methodology that goes into creating like you know super seed resistant uh you know like roundup (laughs) just like a lot of the stuff that we tend to you know kind of wince at from big ag um is not very applicable in cannabis because there's too much there's there's almost like too many uh, reasons to grow cannabis. And whereas, you know, something like a soybean, it's, you're after like a few variables you're after like protein content, oil production, um, you know, disease resistance and pesticide resistance. (laughs) And so, or, or, uh, herbicide as well. So you can spray the heck out of it with chemicals and toxins and the plant resists it. Um, but with cannabis, you know, none of those traits apply and the traits that do apply are much more subjective. So, Mm. you know, is this flower beautiful? Does it, um, you know, have produce, uh, euphoric and enjoyable effect? Is it, you know, a wonderful turpin that you're getting out of it. Does it have medicinal, you know, does it have CBD and, or does it create anxiety? Does it make you want to sleep? There's so many things that we've yet to figure out, you know, and totally unlock. I mean, obvious ones that we're already using cannabis for are like, you know, epilepsy. It's right. seems to really, really help people with that. Uh, cancer patients when they are lose appetite a hundred percent, we know it is a huge help for that, uh, pain relief and the list goes on. So we're still going to, we still have so much work generally as breeders, but I think it is time to start doing, you know, breeding for, um, the pure line breeding and, and breeding for true breeding hybrid stuff, but it's a long and, and long process. And a lot of the seeds that we put out there aren't full, full blown hybrid mm-hmm. genetic, but um, people seem to like them. And, you know, we're well known for being producing feminized seeds that are very uniform and uh, hit the check all the boxes for, you know, I mean, right now it's, People are, and at least in commercial cannabis, seems like, you know, THC is a big driver. Um, you know, turpins are, are really important too. People like gassy turpins. And as of late, all of a sudden purple is popular again. <laughs> yeah. So it's a what? fickle, it's like a fickle market too. You have to be prepared and have enough tools in your, in your tool shed to be able to, you know, I've always loved purple. Don't get me wrong. And, and I'm certainly glad that we still have plenty of purple tools in the tool shed because it's back and popular again. Um, whereas five years ago, people used to scoff at some of our purple varieties and it's just so silly, but we were also lucky enough to be now recognized well in the, entire industry where we get to set some trends of our own and so you know we win cups and get have influence as well um for some of those trends uh 
you know, we, I don't know, like the, when I say trends, I, I really just mean very popular genetics that become, oh, okay. you know, popular worldwide mm-hmm. or, you know, and don't ask me how they get there, but they do. <laughs> and, uh, okay. you know, like our blueberry muffin, for example, has circled the world many times <laughs> and people love it. Um, you know, most recently, like a year and a half ago, two years ago, we came out with a strain. Uh, originally we called it jelly rancher. Uh, <laughs> and then we found out fairly quickly that the, a certain candy company wasn't too happy about that. So we changed the name to hella jelly. And, um, rather than, you know, get into a big stink with them, you know, mm-hmm. So I've always loved that candy anyway, or I've always, I used to go to Hershey park as a kid and ride on the, the comet roller coaster and okay. <laughs> through the, like where they make the Hershey's kisses and you get to see the candy bar rolling across the thing. I was, I'm not going to get in an argument with those guys. I, they, <laughs> I remember that too much from my childhood. <laughs> what are some of the things about big egg that make you wince? Oh, you know, like, I mean, monocrop, monocropping, loss of diversity, uh, Mm. you know, I mean, I'm also, you know, consolidation of wealth is also just something that really seems to be happening so fast in our country that, you know, the whole back to the whole 1% thing and, and all of that. And, uh, you know. I just, I worry sometimes about, you know, like my kids and, you know, are they going to have the chance to live the American dream and, you know, buy a house or eventually, you know, get a house of their own, have a mortgage and, or, you know, or if they don't scramble, um, like I've had to do for the last eight years, are they going to, you know, just be stuck working, you know, a job that just pays so little that they can never afford to get ahead at all, never have right. a savings and be, be dependent on social security and, and who knows what's going to happen to that. So it is uh it's crazy. Oh, go ahead. It's not, it's not even big ag that makes me wince as much as it's just, you know, it's the, the way that we've kind of gotten away from community too. And, and I don't think that having, I mean, there is a, there's such a thing as, as corporate culture and corporate community. But at the end of the day, it's still hierarchical. And I like the human community where you have, you know, just interaction and, and, uh, you know, somebody can't just decide they don't like you and fire you from life. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I know that we're, uh, uh, we're running out of time, but I wanted to know about uh, your Columbia project and then some of your R and D projects that you have going on in South Africa and Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. So, um, my business partner Ben Lind is probably the best person to talk to for for a lot of that. But um, I do know a decent amount of, about the Jamaica project because I went down to Jamaica initially. Um, I believe it was like twenty. 18 and uh just helped pheno hunt seeds down there and and kind of made some introductions and i was working for a one of the current jamaican dispensaries that they have some of our uh genetics that they kind of helped you know mix with some of the original jamaican flavors down there too but um yeah uh so we're doing, we're working with pure Jamaican and I really like the way that they've set their project up. We've also got the benefit of, um, the main professor for plant studies at the university of the West Indies. And he is an amazing guy. He came with us on our, the last, most recent Spanibus, um, and Dr. Manuel is his name, but um, he, uh, you know, is such a wonderful researcher. And I just know that 
the research that he's doing is going to unlock some incredible things. It takes time. I mean, stuff like that, you know, he's going to be studying this plant for the rest of his life. I'm sure he's a fairly young, um, PhD professor. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of excitement about being able to work so closely with him going down the road. So that's pure Jamaican. Ed Rosenthal's involved with that project as well. He actually kind of introduced us to Scott and the rest of the crew there. Um, the Columbia project, uh, we've got several, I mean, we're nature suticals is the group down there that primarily we're working with, but we've also got some smaller nursery projects going, um, in different areas. Um, and then South Africa, I mean, one of the things that was really cool about Jamaica and South Africa is we've actually just been able to do, um, and like I said, Ben's the better person to speak to this stuff, but you know, um, the, the giant volcano that went off in the Car Caribbean and just wiped out, uh, Oh, we pretty much wiped out the entire island. And I'm just trying to think of. Oh, Togo? No, that was the one in this in South Pacific, right? Oh, sorry. This, yeah, it, this was um, about two years ago, a big volcano. And I, I before I didn't even really realize oh. that there was a lot of volcanic activity in the Caribbean, but mm -hmm. there is. And so our Jamaican project we donated, they had just legalized cannabis. Um, then they had the natural disaster and we were able to donate, uh, I think it was 10,000 seeds to their, you know, rebuilding of their cannabis industry. So that was really a wonderful thing to be able to be a part of. And uh, I will find out exactly what the name of that country was, but it's a very small country that was devastated by this natural disaster. And then uh, down in South Africa as well, we've had the capacity to, um, you know, just provide seeds uh, for these upstart groups that are wanting to, you know, build good businesses down in South Africa. And um, a lot of, you know, just donating stuff generally around Africa. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, wanting to do some, some work there just to kind of help figure out, you know, South African climate is not incredibly different from here, but there's a lot of areas of Af Africa that are ob obviously the polar opposite of North America. So, um, you know, it's always interesting exploring that. I know a close friend of ours, a nursery operator that we do a lot of, you know, he propagates a lot of seeds for us, uh, had been down in uh, along the Blue Nile and the White Nile River in, um, well, Egypt and Ethiopia and was able to bring back some incredibly rare land race seeds um several years ago and and those have been really interesting to play with because you just see this incredibly vast diversity that's within the species they they were um apparently they you know down in in ethiopia they would flower and finish up just along the lines of you know the normal there's not much season down there cause it's close to the equator, but, but you know, you'd have a th four or five month life cycle for the plant, maybe six months. But when I grew them here, <laughs> they went, we started them in, in the March when we normally would start. And then we were finally just decided we had to chop the buds down, come, literally christmas january it was like the the oh. longest longest flowering strain i've ever seen in my life <laughs> double as long as oh, anything wow. i had ever so that was just really interesting just like 
you know, ganja from all over the world and, and how much it varies and how unique it can be. What of all the strains you produce is your favorite? <laughs> um, boy, that's tough. I, I think I did. I mentioned that the Hella Jelly was the one that we came out. That one won a bunch of awards. I mean, right now, that's the one that I often will recommend people, you know, start with. Uh, not just for like a newcomer, but I mean, like even, you know, a commercial. And it's a good one for a newcomer, but for a, a brand new cannabis. Sorry about that. For brand new cannabis, you really want something that's super easy. And my favorite one is our blueberry muffin. It's so easy, fairly foolproof, and um, just really straightforward, easy to grow. What can the cannabis equipment news audience, you know, expect from Humboldt Seed, you know, uh, in the next couple of years? Well, you know, I think we're going to keep um, pushing like with seed technology and we, we're already doing marker assisted breeding. So that is really just a way of like, you know, looking deeper with genomics into cannabis and be, being able to make some predictions like you're not you know, like I said, we're not doing CRISPR, we're not doing genetically modifying seeds, but we, we can breed a lot faster with marker assisted breeding. And it's essentially just a way of like, you know, instead of sorting through a population of 300 seedlings to try to find the one that inherited autoflower and inherited the other traits that you mm. uh, want, you, you can actually have a marker from that uh, population and, and just be able to do an assay for it. And then boom, now you know it's, it's number 233 rather than having to wait six months to find out. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, it sounds interesting. And it was really, really cool to hear your story about how, you know, uh, how you not only founded the company, but to where it's become today and some of the really cool projects that you have on a global scale. You know, is there anything else that we might have left out or anything in particular you want to uh, make sure we don't forget? Just, you know, I would suggest everybody every now and again, try something new, try a new genetic and uh, we're improving all the time. And, and so are the rest of our colleagues out here in, that are doing a bunch of breeding. So just as you, you know, get used to your equipment, you know, who knows, maybe the new equipment you have will be perfect for either a, a retro strain that you want to bring back or, or something that's brand new. And, and it might be just the easiest, best thing you ever grew. Well, Nathaniel, thank you very much for taking the time today, man. I really do appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a beautiful day here in Humboldt. I probably should get back to work. I got a crew out there and, uh, you know, got to tend to the ladies you got to get back at it. All right. Well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. All right. For Nathaniel Pennington, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast.